Another episode of Unpredictable Thoughts Podcast. Your boy Troubles in the building. Doing the damn thing. Ain't doing nothing at all. Yo, it's been a minute since the last time I recorded. Yo, y'all need to reach out to AC, Jones, all them. Because they don't want to record. Or they just ain't. They've been busy. You know, AC getting that gunny money now. So, he don't know how to act. But, you know, salute to the fellas on that. Um... Today I just dropped, uh, what is it? It's like the Donny T. So check that out on the www.unpredictablethoughts2.com website. Make sure you get that Keep Day Same Energy sweatshirts, tank tops, hoodies, all that good stuff. But um, let's get into the episode. We have a very, very special guest, somebody that I always just been like, just like looking, looking at her on social media and like she's always dropping gems. Um, she dropped gems after gems after gems that will hurt your feelings and don't care about it. You know why? Because when she hurt your feelings, it be the truth. Oh, you I be mad at the truth. But I got my sister out here, you know, Demetra. Last time I know you, yeah. hold on. Yeah, Demetra. There you go. <laughs> That's it. It's Jamaica. Some people call me Jay. You know, call me Jay for sure. Call me Jay. What's up, y'all? <laughs> yeah, but like just looking at you or just like the like knowing you for like a long time, right? Yeah. Knowing you in the Marine Corps just by yep. like last names was by it was uh met you in with Cali on yep. the deployment training. Yep. And then, you know, and then watching you get out to bloom was just crazy because it's just yeah. like, you, know, you got your little you got farm. I don't want to call you farm, but you got farm. <laughs> <laughs> you do your own real estate. I don't know if you still do real estate. I've, uh, I'm getting back into, I have my license and I, I was doing residential. I switched over to some investment. I switch over to investment uh, properties, non-residential investment properties. And so uh, in the near future, I'll be doing some small residential real estate again. But yeah. Okay. And then like, then you have like a diamond project, carbon solution. Yeah. That is, yep. Yeah, that is a part of my, so I own an investment, land investment group. And then the project is where the farm comes in, where we purchased a farm and we're growing food using solar energy. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I, you really, you really just. Be on, the low, be on the QB sneak, you know. Be, I keep it on the low, though. I don't, I don't, you know, Lamborghini say they don't make commercials for people who, you know, you never ads because they don't make commercials for people who be watching TV so I don't really do the ads it's my target audience yeah god if like if you know you know if you know you know but just overall like I always admired you because it's just like you're a go-getter and like yeah. and I guess what really drew me in was like some of the stuff that I think about on a constant basis, you just put it out there to the world. Like, you don't care. Like, it is what yeah. it is. Like, sometimes with me, I always have that balance of like, you know, they say, well, you don't know your dreams, they can't shoot them down. Yeah. But well, you. I feel, no, I don't feel any of that. I um, So there's like a two side thing to that. Sometimes I feel that. Um, well, number one, what's for you is for you, period. Oh. There's nothing you can do. You can't mess it up. If it's for you, it's for you. And I've learned that everything I say, everything I said I'm going to do out loud, either I post it on social media or I say it out loud, I always end up doing it because I feel like, one, what's for me is for me. Two, 
I don't care what happens. I'm going to make sure nobody else can ruin that for me. As long as I put in the work and I do what I'm supposed to do and I'm aligned with what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm going to make it happen. And I feel a lot of times what happens is that a lot, especially like now in our generation where we have like social media as like a big platform and a lot of people uh, feel the need to protect their, their genius and their dream from this digital web, right? Because mm -hmm. they think everybody can, oh, if someone sees me saying I'm going to do this thing, then they can come and stop it. And it's just like, eh, no. Also, I feel like people who aren't doing enough, they don't like to see other people. They don't like, a lot of people don't like to see go-getters go get. Yeah. It, it makes you feel comfortable. People who are, are comfortable with just bare minimum doing just regular stuff, it, it would irritate them to see me come on social media and be like, I'm gonna go buy a farm. And they'd be like, oh, well, I, ain't, I wouldn't put my dreams on it. And what I do, went and bought a farm. And so it's just like, I don't never, I never feel the need to not um, say what I'm gonna do. I never feel like if I come out and be like, I'm gonna do this, that if I say it anywhere else, anybody could take that from me because I, I, I have a long track record of doing what I'm saying I'm going to do. And I also know it intimidates people, but it also opens a door to people who want to be a part of those things. So like when I came to social media and I was like, listen, this is what I'm trying. This is how I started my company. I, I was watching Queen Sugar in <laughs> 2016. And I remember I was on my Snapchat and I was like, one day I'm going to have like this really big farm and like I'm going to create generational wealth with this farm. Right. And this is October in 2016. Right. I said that on my Snapchat. And then I began to work for the state of Minnesota and their lands and minerals uh, division, the part of De the Department of Natural Resources, lands and minerals division. And that's where I learned about like how to buy mass amounts of land like for the loan. So I took what I learned there and I was like, I'm good. Y'all taught me a lot and I'm going to go start my company based on what y'all taught me. <laughs> That's how you got it. <laughs> I was like, y'all have taught me so much. And it was like, it doesn't make sense for me to sit here and work for the state of Minnesota and retire and get nothing when I can literally flip everything that I just learned. Cause I'm like, I'm a, again, I'm a go getter. I'm, a, I'm very built like that. Like it, anytime I learn some new information, I'm always thinking about how to use whatever I learn to my advantage to make me more wealthy. So I was like, okay. I start, I was like, I'm, I'm going to start this company, but I can't do it by myself because I believe heavily in teamwork. There's nothing, nobody achieves anything great by themselves. Thank and you. I was like, how am I going to get other people, you know, how am I going to get these other key players, people that are interested in doing the same thing that I'm trying to do? Mm -hmm. I went on my Instagram story and I was like, listen, this is what I'm trying to do. And I had thought everything out and I put it all out there. And I was like, this is what I'm trying to do. If you're interested, let me know. So like 15 people hit me up. They was like, I'm interested, right? But we know I didn't finish with all 15 people. So <laughs> yeah. they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So me, I'm dead. When I say I'm going to do something, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So they came to me. I was like, cool. Boom. Went and start. I started drafting the articles of uh, incorporation. But like, I also have a paralegal degree. So like, I know <laughs> I went to school for So like people, we talk about that, right? People get out of the military and they're like, I'm going to go to school. And they usually don't go to school for things that they can use to their advantage. So I was like, I'm going to go to school for a paralegal because in the beginning, I kind of did want to be an attorney. And then I worked with attorneys and I was like, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, but it's a good resource to have to know different types of law. And I flourished really well in real estate law and business law. So I started doing the articles in corporation. I started like taking my own personal money, filing, like I started scouting lands, everything like that. So I dropped down to like 10 people, like five people fell off and then 10 people in my articles of incorporation. And then like, it got time to actually purchase the property. I was like, all right, where the money at? And then like, I was down to like seven people. And right now that's what my company is, is seven people who went through this process with me and we started a company and like immediately we started just like buying properties left and right, left and right. But based off of like a, a, a plan that I had originated all from like 2016. So it was like two years in the making for like two years straight. I was just plotting, planning, learning, researching, finally pitch it out to the people. And it would have never happened if I didn't say it on social media. You know what I'm saying? 
do, do you think that you putting it out on social media kind of holds you accountable? Is that like accountable accountability part? Yeah, yeah. it's like, it, it's like, I don't like to be somebody who doesn't do what they say they're going to do. I love to be like, that's a part of my ethos is like to I'm, loyalty is like a thing to me. So if I'm, if it's my goal, I'm going to be loyal to my goal and be loyal to my work. Also, these people are relying on me. Like they've given their money to me to flip an investment for them. I don't want to look dumb because that speaks to like my, cre- my credibility. Your character. Sure. Right. I see myself like on the cover of Forbes. I want people to like know the story and for the, I don't want anybody to be like, that's not true. That's not <laughs> yeah. money. She did. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I honestly believe that like you need to speak things out into the universe. I feel like a lot of people out of fear that someone, once you get to thinking like that, like something can, somebody can take something from you. It is not yours because that's like a, it's like a, it's the law of attraction. Mm. You have to constantly be believing. You have to like with no doubt, no fear, no nothing. You can't, as soon as you drip fear into whatever you're trying to do, then that's when it becomes not yours. I don't care what anybody says. I could put right now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know, buy a Tesla in 2021. And if that's what I say I'm going to do between now and December 31st of 2021, I'm going to be out here trying to figure out how <laughs> I'm going to drive off the lot. And, test. <laughs> and that was crazy part is that was the exact thought that you put out to the world that I was actually thinking. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm credit score up. I'm into the stock market now. Investments are good. I was pondering about the fact of a Tesla. And then I see, yeah. and I see, I see you. Oh, I'm getting me a Tesla. I'm like, oh. That is my dream car. Well, so like and i'm starting um, to see them more like in my yeah, vision of yeah. it, so. it, it puts it it puts it it's so weird like people i don't know because like i guess like spirituality and i don't want to dig too deep into that but like kind of nope. this is like where the episode is going but what you say you're like you're in the vibration of whatever you say whatever you think that is what you're going to attract so when people are like I never say anything like negative about myself. People like, oh, uh, don't ask me for no money because I'm broke. I would never say that. Like, I would never, because I'm (laughs) trapped. I'm like, no, I'm wealthy. I've been telling people all the time, I'm a millionaire. In the beginning, it irritated people were irritated with me. I would come on the internet every single day. I'm like, I'm a millionaire. (laughs) I sure am. Oh, people, and all this money, they, Shut up! Don't care. I'm a millionaire. I remember, I used to see you with the sage. You, yeah. you, you, you have sage, and then you have like three hundred dollars, just like right. Yes. Yeah, you have sage in my house. Yeah, I'm in the energy of abundance. Yeah. I'm in the energy of you. Put it out. It'll come back to you. So, like, you re- you're seeing more Teslas now because that's where you're in the vibration of that. You're you're like manifesting. It's it's like slowly coming to you. Well, not slowly. It's coming to you, and you're you've put yourself in that vibration to receive that. So every time you see it, it's like a reminder. The universe is trying to remind you. Hey, remember that time you said you wanted that? Okay, well, get in get in alignment with whatever's going on, so you can actually bring it into fruition. Yeah, so speaking of alignment and kind of backtracking, um, just especially, especially like on your businesses or whatnot in, in your endeavors, is a, yeah. is a video that you um, talked about and you were talking about emotional demolitionist. Dem- yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And like when you, when you was going through that, I was like, I know exactly what you mean. I know. Uh, so it's just like, we, we go in this space of, like, you know, when we're growing, we'll be like, um, no new friends, right? Yeah. However, yo, some of those old friends are our emotional demolitionists. So it's just like. Yeah. It's the people you're thinking, right? So everyone serves their purpose. We get to know them. And for however long we're supposed to know them, we know them for that time. Mm-hmm. And I, I come to find is that people who are successful, their growth is constant like they're never you're never they're never gonna they're never the same person but not in a bad way it's not it's not like switching up and being like 
phony or anything. It's like I've grown, I'm, I'm continuing to progress. People who are comfortable with themselves, comfortable with their conditions, always want things to be the same way. Mm-hmm. They're emotional demolitionists because what will happen is they will attach themselves to you and then they will take issue when you begin to grow. Mm. And they don't like to grow. They won't challenge themselves to grow. Everything will be your fault. Everything will be, oh, well, you didn't do it this way. You didn't do, oh, you used to, remember you used to act this way or, you know, and it's just like, I don't have to act that way anymore because I've, I've learned something. People who... I've, I have, so I believe, and I've encountered people, that's why I, I turned, I, I don't think I coined this phrase, but I'm sure someone else has thought of this as well. Mm-hmm. But I've dealt with a series of people this year in particular, whom during times of chaos and challenge, or like chaos and, and strife, you ask them to do what you do, which is to assess their own personal behavior and whatever was contributed to whatever issue is going on. And they have the hardest time owning up to whatever part they took in the situation. Mm -hmm. They don't care to, again, assess themselves. Like nothing's ever wrong with them. They're never, it's never their fault. You know what I'm saying? Something goes down and they also don't know how to receive good things. Like they, there's, I believe there's a certain set of people who just don't know how to receive goodness. There, it's like, it's like, I just dealt with the situation not too long ago, like last week, where I had an individual who uh, was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to earn this much amount of money. And I'm, I'm so my job is strategic planning. I do development. So my job is basically to go get money, capital for organizations, for businesses. So I go out and I find the money and I get it back to them. On the so bank. I one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like a, a little fundraiser on like a corporate level. Yeah. yeah. So I had someone who was like, oh, well, I'm trying to grow X amount, dollar amount. Can you help me? I come up with this plan like I normally do. And I literally like handed them. Like if, if I could... The only other, the step the, the the only thing I the only other thing I could have done for this person is literally wrote them a check for the amount that I wrote the plan for because it was right there like it was imme- they were immediately going they to had start. The, you wrote out the whole play for them all the they whole plan. yeah that's my job that's what I do my job is to take someone from point A to point Z using strategy and and like it's like a roadmap I create roadmaps for yeah. People. And so I, I sat down and I created this roadmap for this person and it was like bulletproof. It was like, Chris, when I tell you at a minimum, this person by the end of January was going to make like $20,000 based off of the opportunities, what he wanted. It was like matchmaking. So I matched him with people who, with instances and opportunities where at least at January, we're not even done with 2021. In January, just the first month, he was walking away with $20,000. You know what this fool did? Did the opposite of everything I said to do. And I was like, that's an emotional demolitionist because you're not, you're not even in the energy to receive what you say you want. There are people who will swear up and down, oh, I want to be a millionaire. And then they'll lay around and watch TV all day. Yeah. I'm like, you want to be a millionaire? You can't even manage a thousand dollars. So it's just like, yo, you know, y'all, I mean, not y'all, but you know, a lot of people, they want like all these. Yeah. The money. I'm like, what? You want 10 racks. You can't even. <laughs> you can't. And it even happens. It's not dollars. even. Yeah. It's not even in finances. It's like, it's the same thing with relationships. And I, I'll, I like to associate how people I like to associate the way people behave in in relationships is how they manage their money. I've come to find there's like there's a very thin line between the way that people behave, 
the people, the way people manage their relationships is the same way they manage their finances. I honestly believe that. Give me I, an I example. Study a little bit more into it, but I, I'm a good observer. I'm an observer of patterns, right? Because that's my job is to find patterns. People who, people who uh, don't do well in relationships also probably don't do well with their finances. They're not good. They're not good decision makers. Hmm. They don't like, again, this person, you could give somebody, you could, you could be like a great person, right? You could have great personality, look great, have a great job, like great home, great car, all this other stuff. And someone will be out here like, oh my God, I want to date a person that has X, Y, and Z. And that person shows up and what they'll do. They'll mess it up somehow. They'll get a whole bag. They'll ruin it. <laughs> They'll ruin it. And, then, and those characteristics are similar, I believe, in finances, where someone is presented with a financial opportunity to do something really great, to change their life. And because sometimes either they feel like it's too good to be true or they just don't know, they're, they don't know how to receive things well, or they're just destructive. There are some people who are just absolutely destructive. They take joy and pleasure. In destroying other people, and mm-hmm. destroying good things, things that are are meant to be for pleasure, they just take joy and and being destructive. Yeah, so I, I like to stay away from them kind of people. I, I can tell very fast. I at first it used to be very hard for me to like decipher if someone was emotionally destructive, but um, yeah, I usually. By having conversations with people and like, I can, people pretend all the time, you know, again, people are like, oh, I want, I want this, I want that. Start having conversations with them. Ask them, what have you built? Yeah. What have you built? If you get, if you ask that question enough times, you'll start to get to the core of who is who around you. Yeah. Ask people what they've built. And it doesn't have to be like me, like a real estate company. It doesn't have to even be that big. But have you done nothing? You've done nothing, built something of your own, something that you have, because, you know, my mama, my mama will tell you, you know, somebody who ain't never, who don't have nothing, they'll help you lose everything. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that, that's crazy. So, like, from the opposite end, right, because you have the people that's destructive, mm-hmm. and you, you have people that's destructive, and they're attached to people that's, like, forcing yeah. However, as an individual, from flourishing, sometimes those, you know, emotional demolitionists can be like right hand, one family. Yeah. So, and for you, when did you see and would be a, I guess, a tip to help people like let that person go, to reevaluate that day one, that right hand, that, that family member along their journey? Um, a really quick way I like cut off like I can just like emotionally turn with the switch honestly and it's it's very it sounds silly but it's not ask yourself what bill does this person pay for me oh if you get to the heart of that because like honestly like I'd be like what what exactly does this person do for me what do you do to where you can have that much mind control over me, over my emotions. If you don't do it, if there's not anything you do for me, like at first I might trip. I might be like, dang, that's so-and-so. I don't want to let him go. And then I'll sit up there and I'll be like, what does this person do for you? And I'll start, I'll be like, they don't do nothing. Like what? in a bill, are you just talking about like a monetary factor or? Anything. It could be like just, it doesn't even have to be like a bill. It's like, what does this person do for me? Like, does this person like, does this person actually do anything for me? Like, what? Where? Where's the benefit of having this person? I can assure you, emotional demolitionists—they don't bring anything to the table. Mm. But a, a a a feeling of what could be—that's probably about the only thing they do bring. You talk about family members, uh, friends. The part like related your spouses. I know a spouse. Spouses, anything? Yeah. It might be harder. <laughs> you know me. <what> I mean? <laughs> at one point in life, you know, Jamisha, we, we gotta be honest. At one point in life, for you to identify 
emotional demolition. I mean, I'm, I don't know if in the video you were talking about a spouse. I can't remember or not. But in it, that video, I wasn't talking about a spouse. I was talking about a romantic relationship. Okay. Where I had time I had invested some time into this person and while we were not like there was there was no sharing of any financial oh, okay y'all wasn't that deep yeah or anything like yeah um it was just that I felt like I had invested time and he this he had invested time and then I was like what do you do for me to make me feel like I've invested so much that I can't walk away and Ooh. I was like, do anything for me you've not done all you've done is given me a feeling and at the moment and and you showed me that this feeling can be fleeting at any point so i'm like an investor i like to again there's a relationship between there's a correlation between how people treat their relationships and finances i think about stuff in investment terms okay i got this love stock let's call it love stock yeah. <laughs> Ticker symbol L O V E. I keep this love. I bought this love stock when I first bought it. It was up. Things were going well. It's fluctuated, you know, back up, but not substantially. Around six months after I bought this love stock, it has dropped severely <clears throat> to the point where I'm losing money. Do I keep this stock? Hmm, let's see. Let's go down the trajectory of this industry. Is a stock rooted in anything that pro that is promising? No. Is it equivalent to a Tesla and a Nike stock? Hell no. I'm gonna sell it. And I'm good because staying in it any longer, I'm just going to continue to lose. That's how I think about it. Staying in anything, in any relationship, any friendship. This year, I lost like three friends because again it was like whenever something went wrong I was the only one taking accountability of what I had done wrong mm. and, I, oh, and 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 the reason I know to do that is because I'm a leader is because I'm successful surely if something's going wrong I've done something I've done something I made a, a wrong decision somewhere to be a part of the equation of something going wrong I have no problem taking my my share of accountability. But if you can't even yourself say, you know what, I was wrong too. Oh, I can see, I can see where you, you know, you may have interpreted the if you can't even do that for me, no, I don't, I don't want to. Yeah, because a misunderstanding all is yeah. miscommunication. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Also a lot of jealousy. Uh <laughs> oh wow. Jealous of of just not even I mean, I wouldn't even call 20, even in all the chaos of 2020, I still had an amazing year. Yeah. I feel like that is something that I can attribute to my willingness to stay positive about anything. When people are like, oh my God, COVID, da 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 da, da. I'm not discounting the fact that COVID is real and that it has caused like major catastrophe for a lot of people. But I wasn't one of those people who were going to be like, oh my God, COVID is here. My whole entire life is over. I readjusted like any any successful person would do. You okay, pay. down, yeah. I had a horrible farming season this year, but that's how I know that successful people are versatile. So I would never bank my whole livelihood just based on one, one thing, right? Portfolio, again, investments. Portfolios are supposed to be diverse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when people are like, oh my God, COVID is coming and it's, people are losing jobs. And I'm like, Number one, you need to stay positive, right? It's hard to, people are like, oh, like, shut up, everybody. And I'm just like, no, you need to stay positive and you need to help people out. You need to be, you know what I'm saying? Like thinking of other ways to use this, this thing that is happening to turn it into something great for you. I've seen a lot of people be more creative this year, which I loved it. I love seeing people step back from being miserable in jobs that they didn't even want to be in to being stuck in their homes and like, falling back in love with themselves and finding their passions again and using that as a source of income versus going to these jobs and complaining all day. But I didn't have to do that. And so that created also more animosity. People were like, oh, well, you're, you're, uh, you're privileged. I get called that a lot. They're like, oh, well, you, 
you're sipping champagne during a pandemic, you know? What else am I supposed to drink? Like, I'm just kidding. But yeah, and it's like, people are like, oh, you can't have a, an opinion about X, Y, and Z because you're privileged and like other people aren't, you, you haven't hit any lows or whatever. And it's like, what is privilege? What are, what are they saying that you're privileged about? I'm, I'm trying I'm to. I'm guessing my lifestyle, again, so because I understood years ago, right? Leaving the military was like my saving grace. It taught me a lot. It taught me not to put all of me into one thing, especially one career. It taught me to be very versatile. Yeah. And so because I have been able to embody that, it's like, oh, well, you, you didn't, you didn't feel, I guess people feel like I didn't feel the, the letdown of the pandemic, pandemic. And I was like, that's kind of the point. Like, that's where you're supposed to be. That is the goal. The yeah. goal is that when things happen, you're supposed to have a safety net. You're, that's what you're supposed to be working towards. So how are you upset with me for doing the thing that y'all are trying to do? Y'all the ones trying, oh, you're talking about you trying to be a millionaire? Yeah, and, and, and it goes into your line of, of another video of you saying, you know, um, your abundance is, is tied to your obedience. It is very much so. It is very and much like so. You planted that seed. So if we call it a, a tree, right, an oak tree. Yeah. You probably yeah. planted that seed either before you joined the Marine Corps or while you was in the Marine Corps. I'm, I'm not sure, but you planted that seed, and from that, yeah. you was able to ah, grow and pivot and all that other good stuff in life. So, yeah. yeah. So that's like, yeah, being obedient. So, um, at the end of my Marine Corps career, I was actually going to lat move into uh, counter intel. Oh wow! Yeah, I was. Yes. I, I was one of. I think I was the third female in Marine Corps East to be approved by the Counterintelligence Board because it was like when it first when they first opened up the MOS to yeah. me down there, and I showed out, and I just gave them. They wanted a show, and baby, I gave it to them, and they was like, "No one would ever believe that you are a Marine." Yeah, let's go, and so. <laughs> I ended up taking a different direction and it was like, what happened was like everything, like you got to listen to your intuition. You got to listen to when spirit, universe, God, whoever you believe in. Yeah. When it's, when it's saying go here, a lot of times we get, uh, we get scared to go there because we've never been there, wherever there is. We don't know this direction and we're so comfortable. I was so comfortable with the Marine Corps. I was six years in, it's like my sixth year. And I'm like, oh, this is counter intel. I could get this big ass bonus. I'm guaranteed a paycheck every two years, all this other stuff and everything. The universe was like, no, 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 that's not where you, no, no, no. Come on, you're going this way. And for so long, I was trying to resist it. And so like, at, at one point, I just couldn't, I just couldn't resist it anymore. And I was like, no, I'm not supposed to be. This is not, I'm not supposed to do. And I always think about like, even to this day, I'm like, dang, what would happen if I really did go down that route? Where would I be? I wouldn't be who I am today. But nah. yeah, like who knows like what kind of condition or whatever I would have been in. <laughs> Salty ass, gunny. Oh. I've been, I've probably been miserable and <laughs> kinds of, you know what I'm saying? But I, I was obedient in that. And yeah. so I was obedient in, in, in spirit saying this, that's not for you, even though it's comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Comfortable. It's comfortable having a guaranteed paycheck every two weeks versus you know, yeah. and now you're going to school. Yep. <laughs> and you're in this unsurety of what's going to happen to you. But spirit said, that's where you need to go. Cause your next step is going off to college. And then, like, okay, I was like, well, Spirit, like, tell me, like, it was like, okay, you need to go this route. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go here. And then, like, you need to go this route. So all, everything in me is just like, whenever Spirit says go, wherever it says go, I'm, I've done this long enough to know, if I don't go, not only do I not get what I, what I want, 
I get some shit that I don't want or don't need. And it is so hard to get back on track. It is. It's so hard to get back on track. So people are all the time, they're like, oh, how did you, how did you do all this stuff? How did you do all this stuff? And it's just like, most of the time, I feel like we know what we have to do, but we don't want to do it because, again, that unfamiliarity. Um, like, I was married, and I, I share this story all the time, and, like, Spirit was like, you need to divorce your husband. I was like, this is crazy. What? <laughs> what? Were y'all go- I mean, I don't want to intrude. Were y'all going through something during that time, or...? It wasn't so much that we were going through anything. It was, it was again, it's that when one person is growing and the other person wants it to stay the same, there's a lot of friction. And mm-hmm. I'm one for growth. I'm always, let's go higher, because I want this big. If you, you know, can't grow, you got to go. Yeah, I'm deserving of this big. I know. I see myself, like, my true self, where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to have, like, all these things. I'm supposed to be this person in this big, in this big universe. And so there was a lot of back and forth about that. There was back and forth about like, it was just chaotic. It was, everything was always an argument. And for me, how I'm raising my children, I don't want to raise them in a home of any sort of violence. Even if it's yelling, I still feel like that's very violent for children. And so I was like, spirit was like, this ain't it. This is like, this is where, this is the end. And I was like, come on, go. <laughs> Oh, man. Let me try to stick in it for like another couple months. <laughs> but as soon as I did, as soon as I did what Spirit told me to do, that's when, like, when I tell you abundance flow to me, when I tell you like so many doors, so many opportunity, job opportunity, career opportunity, like all kind of, all kind of just crazy, miraculous things I, I didn't even ask for. Like all these amazing things started happening to me directly after I divorced him and I and so like for me there's like um I was being obedient to get to get my abundance but also I don't think I would have gotten it if I stayed you know what I'm saying? I stayed there because I feel like sometimes there's things that that you that are for you but you can't get them when you're around certain people because the energy is going to be wrong yeah. So would you say, I mean, I, I don't know the man. I don't never want to disrespect him. Would you say he was kind of like an emotional demolitionist then? Um, no. no he, was, okay. No, he wasn't an emotional demolitionist. Nah. He's okay. way like, nah. He, it's just, we were, we were two, we were going in two different paths. Okay. And, and, and no matter how much we love each other, in fact, it was our love for each other that allowed us to let go of each other. Mm-hmm. I was like, you, you are, you want this thing. We wanted two different lives. And because we really love each other, we're going to, we're going to separate our ways peacefully. Right. And say, we still support each other. We're still friends. We, we have a child together. So like we, you know what I'm saying? We obviously can't just dip on each other, but <laughs> we support each other and he's doing well. I'm doing well. But I don't, I don't think that I would be again in this in this position in this seat that I'm sitting in now had I stayed because I would have been a totally different person. My mindset would have been different. I would have probably been stressed, depressed, all of that, and I ain't got time for that. Yeah. So, do you think like with, with situations like that, right? So it could be you know family relationships friendships and whatnot to where like you separate from an individual do you think you could wind Mm -hmm. up coming back as well i would never say never right because you don't know what the universe has in store for you there are there there have been instances where people have uh separated because somebody needs to go off and learn something yeah to come back so i would i would never say never um I don't think that's our trajectory, just given that we want two totally different things. Like in the beginning, we both wanted the same thing. And then as as the marriage progressed and we became exposed to different things, our vision of the end route was totally different. Yeah. And so no way, I don't foresee like his way of life, his end goal, that's not mine. Mine is big, lavish, all of that grand 
everything. And his is very subtle, very, you know, quiet, chill. And I, and I respect that, but that's just not where I'm headed. So, okay, I want to I want to pull the goddamn first truck. Okay. <laughs> first, like, hey, we on it. We on, yeah. So, and it's just getting getting in alignment with people who think like that. I thank God for like my uh my one of my best friends, Shante. Um, last year we spent a good amount of time getting in the vibration of wealth. And we, I used to. The one you did like, Facebook live videos with? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shout, shout your and stuff out. I want you to get your stuff my, out. That's my dog. Yeah. But we would, um, I would say, come practice wealth with me, right? Because, okay. so like, we would, I would spend my days, like, we would start the day and have like this, like, luxurious ass breakfast with like all the like finest china plates and teacups fine cheese and grapes and everything you named it mimosas all of that like i don't have a single plastic paper cup none of that everything in my house everything in my house is like up and up practicing wealth right oh i was like practice wealth with me practice Practice waking up and, and having a breakfast that is like what a wealthy person would eat when they have breakfast. I was like, practice doing with, and we did that every day during the summer. We would wake up whenever we wanted to. We used to both work at the same place. And so our job allowed us like flexibility in our schedule. And we, we, we talked about how like we were going to find these jobs that made six figures and like we wasn't going to have to like work no regular ass nine to five where we were coming in at nine and whatever at five. We spoke all that into existence. We would go shopping. I'd be like, girl, let's just go shop. Like, practice wealth. And a lot of people were like, oh, y'all bougie. Y'all, y'all this, y'all that. And it's like, yeah, we're practicing wealth. Like, that's. <laughs> like, get on the program. Yeah, and to get in the vibration. Because once you're in the vibration, you're, you're there. You're practically there. You, then you're ready to receive. But if you won't, people are like, oh, um. Why won't you eat with like a plastic fork? And I'm like, because I'm in the vibration of wealth. Wealthy people don't eat out of plastic forks. They have like expensive ass china sets, expensive ass like I went in, I have like pottery barn, like forks and, and rose gold. I have rose gold flatware. <laughs> Now you at, my, at, my, at my table, baby, it costs like $80 per set over at Pottery Barn. But I meant that. I was like, that's what I deserve. That's what I deserve. And I'm going to give that to myself. I buy myself flowers, like $80 bouquet of flowers every single week. That's the vibration I want to be in. That's that's who I am. Like, like that's who I am. That's who I want to embody. Because I don't want nothing less than that. Yeah. And I, anything wrong with people who do want less than that that's just not who i am yeah i'm royalty you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah but, but you know, normally when, when, when we talk about wealth and you know the rich and famous mm -hmm. normally they're the, the most cheapest people in the world no so there's like a very big misconception right okay very big um so i work w with millionaires billionaires I, I they like to joke and call me like the uh the billionaire babysitter that's like my name and <laughs> that might be the name the of this babysitter. <laughs> yeah i'm the billionaire babysitter and um contrary to what people believe they do buy very expensive things all the time if you go in their homes very expensive. The cars they drive, very expensive. People like to do this thing where they're like, oh, Mark Zuckerberg drives a, a Honda. Yeah, his Honda costs like $196,000. That, that little hybrid thing, it, it ain't one of them cheap Hondas. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, he doesn't wear designer. Mark Zuckerberg wears like $250 shirts. And just because they don't have a logo on it, you don't know what it is. But that, them shirts be like $250. And he got a whole closet full of them. Mm. Yeah. Just because there's not like a big logo on it doesn't mean oh, you just know, what we identify yeah. as like designer high class. You ain't gonna see YSL LV. No, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, wealthy people do buy very expensive things. The difference is 
And I think you shared something in your story today about how people allow, so poor people buy the luxury without any assets and wealthy people, they use their assets to buy the luxury. That's the difference. Wealthy people be having like Gucci napkins that sit on their table, like, and they be wiping barbecue sauce. <laughs> I was sitting at this this billionaire's house early earlier this year, and we were sitting out in his. It was at a, It was out in Tampa, Florida, mm-hmm. and we pulled in, and like they had to open the gates up. His Ooh. like his back is sitting right there. It's like two big houses next to each other. It's like sitting off on a lake, and we go in, and we're sitting by like the fire pit in his like huge backyard, and like his. I don't even know what to call it. Like, I guess his, what's the female version of a butler? Is it a maid? Would that be considered a maid? Yeah. His maid yeah. pulls up and she's like, can I take your drink order? And, you know, we're ordering drinks. And then, you know, they bring out like all this food and like no oh, shit. Yeah, he had at his house? Yes. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> You know, with my head at first. <laughs> no, I knew about COVID. I'm going to tell you that. But I knew about COVID before everyone else because these billionaires, these people with all the money, they know the things before everyone else knows the things. But we could get into that. But go ahead. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So I was, we were sitting in his house and they're like bringing out like these carts with like all the fancy drink. I'm talking about like a gold cart. It's like made out of gold. Cart. Mm. And like Gucci table napkins where like they bring out the food and people are just wiping like barbecue sauce off their face with gucci napkins so this whole thing about poor people or rich people being cheap and all that yes and no okay i like that but yeah so like it was it was wild like that was like one wild ass night i will never forget like i had cigar smoke stuck in my hair for like a whole week because they was just non-stop just it was worth it's probably them cubans too (laughs) i don't know i don't smoke cigars but i was there he looked like on a like on one side there's a golf course on one side there's like a lake little pond thing so it was like a huge estate but yeah and um i remember sitting there and um we're having this conversation and um, so we're talking about, again, like wealth plan, like I'm supposed to go get him this money for a particular project and uh, or a matchmaking money for a particular project. And one of the concerns about the project, he says, um, well, I'm worried about um, Corona. And so we start laughing because I'm like, are you talking about beer? Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you, like, why are you concerned about a beer? I'm like... Me. like you could just go ask her you know if you want to, her to go to her, she's in corona. like what is it and he's like yeah you know a lot of people are going to be sick and you know they're you know people aren't, aren't going to be able to leave their homes and like how is that going to affect the market and i'm just sitting here like okay excuse me what are you talking about uh, yeah and so like i wrote it like in my notes and i'm like google what he is talking about and so he was like yeah and he started giving out advice and he was like everyone needs to like Take all their money out of this. This was back in February. Okay. Like, everyone needs to take out. No, it wasn't. It was back in December. He's like, everyone needs to take out, take their money out of the stock market and buy gold in real estate. Yeah. Because of coronavirus. And when he said that, I wrote it in my notepad. <laughs> and I went on my, I did exactly what he said. <laughs> and then in March, when everything shut down, I was like, Oh, like I was like, oh my God, like he was right, like, and but they be knowing, like they be having, like wealthy people always know first. That's how they they maneuver their money. Yeah, and finds out on the very on the very at the very end, and it impacts them. All these billionaire, all these wealthy people, they knew months before they were shutting things down that they were going to shut them down, and they were able to move their money and make it work for them. So. Yeah, so that's what I was saying though. Like these wealthy people, they they're not cheap, not by a long shot. Mm. No, um, I think the difference is um, they may be cheap in certain aspects of yeah in money. Like I think sometimes, like some people, it's like ways to build wealth 
where they can be cheap. So people who are like first generation millionaires, they might be a little bit cheaper because they're trying to attain that, like that first million dollars. But after that, <laughs> they out here in business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They don't care. Yeah, I heard your first million, either your first hundred thousand or your first million is hard to achieve. And then after that, your first hundred thousand, once you pass that one hundred thousand dollar mark, you can you can breathe because if you can get if you can get to one hundred thousand dollars and it is relatively very easy if you are in the right industries and you know the, the right ways. But once you get past that first one hundred thousand dollars, it's like. You, if you, if you use it well, you can unlock those other doors. Yeah. And what happens is a lot of people don't know what to do with that first one hundred thousand dollars. They don't know, or they they create um, they create businesses that don't. What's the correct word I'm looking for? That don't honor that that for $100,000. Um, I think one of the, the, the things that I've seen that I kind of like wish I wanna I want to teach to other people about businesses is that while like, I think what happens is our generation is so, they want it so fast and they want it now and they want it now so that they can spend it now. And it's like, they're not like thinking about the the long term right the long term of it all so people start these really, really really fast companies like girls all the time they're like oh i'm gonna go sell some eyelashes and i'm gonna become they're like i'm gonna be a millionaire because i'm gonna sell these eyelashes and social media has made it like a a commonplace and some people have off of social media reached a million dollars because they sold things like eyelashes and lip gloss and all the other stuff. But that's not a norm. Like that's not a normal thing, cosmetics and like quick businesses like that. Yeah. People, I guarantee you by the time they hit $50,000 in sales, they've used that money to flip it in some other industry. I don't think a lot of people think about a strategic plan um, in regards to business. And it's something that like, I want to, I want to give as a resource to other people. I, I, especially, you know, young black professionals, I really want us to consider like to take business seriously. Yeah. Yeah. But to not be just like this, this thing where it's like, it's a trendy thing to do. And it's just like, Oh, I'm going to go start a business. Like I've seen so many like secretary of state certifications. And it's like, I got my secretary say, and I started a business. It's like, okay, what's your business going to do? What's your five-year plan? Like, who's your target audience? What are you going to do if you don't? Like, if you yeah. don't... Is your market, is the market that you're coming into um, overly yeah. saturated? What's your competition? Yeah. Like, like, they yeah. don't know. They don't test the market. They don't do anything. I wish, I want to see more, especially more of us create businesses based off of ideas instead of products because you Ooh. can idea lives forever yeah whereas products don't creating businesses that are um centered around like um methods instead of products mm -hmm. right because technically invention inventions like you're inventing a new way to do something you patent it and it's forever yours and it's something that is just like on and on and on and on so like we know a black person invented the elevator. He is forever revered to us because he had an idea and he became wealthy off of his not his idea, his genius, not so much a product. Yeah. Let's start creating more of those businesses. Those are the businesses that are going to bring that that generational wealth. Not just the type of wealth that you can touch, but your great great grandchildren can touch. That's yeah. what I want from us. Yeah, same here, and it, it goes into my last topic of the night of just like uh, just creating generational, true generational wealth. It's it's kind of twofold, right? So it's just like I feel as though within the black, because I tweeted this like last night, the night prior. I was like mm -hmm. within the black community, like nepotism is frowned upon. However, yeah. like if you know somebody that got the news games, the uh, PlayStation Five, or can get you in the line in the club, uh, like yo, what's up? 
I'm gonna use it as a plug, but like if you know yeah. something that can like maybe certify your LLC or help you with your LLC, yeah, I'm gonna do it myself. I don't want no help. <laughs> it's like why? Yeah, that, that is, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, do you? I, see it? I do. Um, I think so. It might be like a pride thing. It might be like this thing where it's just like, oh, look, I did this on my own. Cause like we like to do that self made. I'm self made. And it's like, no, actually, you're not. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nah, there are other people included. There had to have been other people included in your process. But um, during the beginning of the, of the pandemic, I actually took on five um, black women owned businesses and I created strategic plans for them for free because I wanted to offer something that most of us can't like the average small business can't afford me. Okay. Hey, tell them your course. Hey, <laughs> hey, let these they can't. work. They can't for my services because what because of what I come with my skills my knowledge they can't afford me most I like the reason these fortune 500 companies do so well is because they pay people like me top dollar to make sure they hit they the, the plan gets ex that there is a plan and it gets executed the way it's supposed to be yeah businesses don't have the budget to do that so what I wanted to do was in, in my hopes to see these people, I didn't, I wanted to do something more than just hope that people would, you know, actually care about real business. I reached out to five different black owned, black women owned businesses, women who hadn't started their business yet or freshly started their business. And I, you know, I helped them create a, a 10 year plan for their business thing, like the, the same way I would do it for Dell or Walmart or whoever else free of charge. And they were like, the conversations that I had were mind blowing because they were like, oh, I didn't even know. I didn't even think about hearing. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And it's like, we're not taught. Generationally, we're not taught how to build businesses. No. So, and a lot of us, this is like, for a lot of people, it's their first wave. They miss out on a lot of critical information that, that they look to these companies and they're like, oh, Apple has been around for this period or Amazon's been around. You know how long, you know why these companies have been around for such a long period of time? Because they have access to different types of resources that you either cannot afford or you just don't even, you're not aware of. Yeah. And so what happens is I think people, because they want to be classified as self-made, they will, they will try to chart into the, the territory of running a business and they completely skip out on all the, the very necessary technical skills that you need to make a, not only start a business, but make it run long, 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 long term. Like how to properly file an article of incorporation, like um, a, a, a strategic plan, every single, every single, I don't care, a government agency, any business that has stayed in business more than 10 years, have a strategic plan. Yeah. They have to out and say, I'm gonna, this is how you go from this place to this place. Don't think about it. But but do you think the reason that is is because their vision is much more larger versus you know some of our first term generational wealth or first time business owners, they like, look, I'm just not trying to work with a white man no more. Like some of the <laughs> I think that's also a factor. Yeah. I think there's a very false um, narrative going around where people urge people to start businesses and it, it puts, it, it ruins business for a lot of people. That is ownership as well. Yeah. There's this pressure to be like a business owner. There's this pressure to be, oh, I'm a boss now. I'm a boss because I started this company and I got this and it's just like, <laughs> are you sure you don't even have correct leadership skills because you're addressing your customers on your personal Facebook page when you should be writing policies and procedures and posting them on your website and then telling your customers if they're if they have any inquiries where to go so it's just stuff like that where like a lot, of, a lot of this, yeah it's just like very small things where because we're so used to be we want to be self-made right we want to be I want to work for myself. 
and I'm self-made. Can't nobody tell me what to do. And it's just like, you should be listening. You should be finding people to tell you what to do because this is your first go around. You don't know what you're doing. So you should yeah. be looking out for people who would say, hey, like, um, so I see this a lot, again, with young Black business owners. Like, that's, I think that's one of the things that really irritates me. Um, and I can give a class on this about how people talk to their customer, how they address their customers. We know that black business owners have like this very bad rap. They're like, oh, I don't shop with black businesses because they food and da, 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 da. And it's just like, yes, but also no. Like, cause you know, Starbucks has been very racist, but y'all still up here with these cups in your hands. Exactly. <laughs> but black business owners also have an obligation to develop themselves as business leaders. And what does that mean? That means the same way Apple wouldn't come on you know what I'm saying? The person that the CEO of Apple is not going to get on his own Facebook and tell y'all, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you don't like how these AirPods work, kiss my ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Apple has somebody, Apple has a policy and procedure page. They have, if you, if you, if you're having trouble with X, Y, and Z, this is where you can go. This is how we can help you. Yeah. A lot because we want to be so self-made and we're the only person that we're relying upon to either learn how to run business or actually do business we become that hub where it's like i don't even know how to directly i don't even know customer service but do you think some people put out they, they think they put out too too good, a, too good of a product where it's just like yo i'm gonna put this out and it ain't gonna come back because it's so damn good so to where it's like, yo, they don't even need that or they're not even thinking that round because it's just like, yo, if I'm doing kids for cakes and like the family loved it for three Thanksgiving straights, yeah, any wrong with this, you know? Yeah, I think a lot, there is a very, when you are, um, there is a, a very tricky arrogance with, with a lot of, yeah, young first time entrepreneurs, business owners, especially who, uh, I mean, obviously when, when you're like, especially people who are in smaller towns and they, and they have just like a monopoly on certain things. So like young photographers and you said people who make cakes, like stuff like that. They have a monopoly wherever they live at because they might be well known. So it's just like, well, they, I'm well known. So like, what are you going to tell me? Even if I tell you to kiss my ass because you don't like this cake. Like, what are you going to do? I still have like 297 other customers because, but they stay, they usually stay locally or regionally. They don't hit that, but they're trying to though. Like they want to become, you know, they want HGTV to be like, Hey girl, come make this cake on TV. But yeah. they don't have that. They don't have that networking capability understanding of how relationship relationship before is such a big thing yeah relationship equity is so big to me and i've been preaching that okay. all of 2020 or whatnot and it's just like yo you know uh manners that take you with money won't at the end of the day so, oh, so will so will it sure oh i can i can uh, oh <laughs> I, um i had an instance this year where somebody that I thought um, was a, I didn't think they were my friend, but I just thought we were good in business. I've always done right by this person in business. And um, she lucked up on an opportunity and I was happy for her. And this opportunity is not like a one for one person. It's like anybody could do this. And I, I was like, hey, you know, can you give me the um, contact information because I'm trying to get the same thing for my business that, sh that you got. And she was like, oh, they're not going to do it for you. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, when did we become competition? Like, when did you, that's not for you to decide what they're going to do for me. I asked you for a contact and an and a, and a open door. So what happened was I, um, I brought a lot of business to her business through my own business. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, if that's the role you want to play, I'm just going to remove my business from yours and we'll see. How well are you doing? Because <laughs> people like me. I'm a good person. I'm, I like I I build relationships with. I was at a I so with the farm part like farm last year grew all kind of everything carrots tomatoes you name it collard greens lettuce all that and I sold 
at this farmer's market and I'm, I got so good. Like I'm so good with relationships. Like I had this one customer named Miss Nancy and Miss Nancy and her husband, they're like, they're like 78 years old and they only eat like organic fresh stuff and they make like little juice. Like I learned all this stuff about Miss Nancy and I only seen her once a week at the farmer's market. Yeah. And so, like she talks to me about her kids, like her grandkids, all of that. Like tell me about like her apartment, all that. And so what happens is when you are able to develop those relationships with people in a good way, that I feel like that is what drives your your business. And in your inability to do that can also hinder it. Yeah. But I still I still have policies and procedures on my website. I still was like, if if something goes wrong with your crop. If you get back home and you cut into your lettuce and you find a worm, this is how you can get your money back. This is how, because if, because Apple does that for me, right? That's what I expect to see with Apple. That's what I expect to see with Dell. That's what I expect to see with the electric company. Everybody who's in business, they do business. They do business. Yeah. Do you- but because a lot of people want to be self-made. They don't want to do business. They want to just be in charge. Is that but so okay like since you bring bring up Apple right so we know like I mean the common person wouldn't know if you until you like big into the stock market until you big into Apple right so we know Steve Jobs he was just the the innovator he was the creator right mm-hmm. he yep. can't run a business he can't no. he hired Tim Cook yeah now, Tim Cook top five CEOs of yep. all time. He's top five. So what I'm getting from you is similar to how Apple run their stuff. Yes, you could be the creator of Kids for Cakes. However, you know, if you wanted to run your books, to do the customer service, hire, get somebody to volunteer. Investing in your company. A lot of people do not want to invest, again, because they have this self-made. It's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And it's like, if you would take some money, and in, and then hire someone who and then hire an accountant. Like you shouldn't be. I would not even recommend if you have a business and you are generating money. I don't care if it's somebody at a at, at the bank that your business account is open with. Have an accountant beside yourself looking over your money. There should be no reason why. At a minimum, you need external eyes as an accountant because even. Even us sometimes, right? We, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah, especially if you look at numbers all day. Yeah, yeah. You need somebody else looking at your money for you. You need somebody else to to be your checks and balances, right? And it can't be your mama and your cousin and them who like you and who gonna tell who won't tell you that your your that cake you made is nasty. They're not gonna tell you that because they don't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah. Sometimes they might want some free treats from you, so they're not gonna tell you that. You need somebody who don't really know you, who's gonna say, "Hey, that's the wrong recipe. You need to do that. Do that different. Do mm-hmm. something different." With that. And then also having, being a leader. Steve Jobs was a great leader because he could take direction. Yeah. He could take direction from that, from that those that those staff of people who come together and they say, "Hey, look." We know this is the vision. This is where you're trying to go, but maybe this is not the best way. Consider a lot of us don't have that. We don't. We're not willing to because it's our. It's a threat to our quote unquote creativity. Or again, sometimes we just we don't. We haven't developed those skills, those leadership skills that allow us to, to have someone else legitimately look at our stuff and be like, mm, I don't think that's gonna work. I look. That's why I kind of scale back on my stuff because I'm like. First off, I'm like, am I even doing this right? Because I was freestyling it. Then I'm like, yo, I'm in school for business management. So I'm like, instead of keep on doing it, let me learn from my classes. Yeah. Grow as I go. So I'm like, that's why I'm like, yo, you know, I'm getting in a place. Legit. You can't see me. I can see you. (laughs) Yeah. That's a big deal. A lot of people. Yeah. That is a big, big deal. Legal, I know a lot of, again, small businesses, they don't have the budget to include legal counsel. (laughs) But you mess around with the right person. (laughs) 
You can get sued. Yeah, and see the thing about this, man. Um, I've been talking to my homeboy about this. I was like, look, you know, starting a business is cool, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm not in it no more to be like a dollar in the green room. Mm-hmm. I have enough education right now to get into the stock market. And mm-hmm. if you've been following me, I've just been posting dividends. Yep. I've been posting dividend plays and whatnot. So we all know my goal, my dividend play is. And I was like, well, with that, LLC, I'm gonna do a I'm gonna have stocks within the LLC. And mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll use all my knowledge, put that into the dividend play or whatnot, and then I just my LLC fund itself. Oh, yeah. So yeah. There's no that's more that's in the dream. But, but see, people don't even, they're not, they don't think like, so, so you're working smarter and a lot of people don't want to work smart. They don't want to take that time out to sit down and, and read and educate themselves about things that they don't know so they can find a smarter way out. They want to rap and to sell t-shirts and whatever else mm. and just and be done with it like that and it's just like no there's so many other ways to tap into that first hundred thousand or that twenty five thousand or whatever whatever your goal is there's so many other ways to do it that don't require you like over exerting yourself in so many different ways and like stretching your business is exhausting when you don't know what you're doing yes it is a lot of people are like oh it's so hard being a business owner actually it's not it's not you're it, it People, I enjoy doing business because I be researching what I be doing. <laughs> yeah. and I don't know something. When I'm, my most frustrating days come from me not knowing what is going on and not taking the time to like prepare myself. I'm, I will always tell somebody Google is free. No. A lot of people are like, oh, well, I didn't go to school. You went to school. I was like, first of all, I didn't go to school for business. Yeah. For leadership. I didn't go to school for real estate. Well, I did go to real estate school, but it's not like college or anything. A lot of stuff that I learned was my own willingness to sit down and teach myself the stuff that either one, they don't want us to know, or two, that it's like that privilege thing. It's like, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't, and nobody's going to come tell you. Yeah. And at this point in life, it's like, I'm not even mad about the game anymore. Yeah, once when, you learn it, once you want, you're just like, well, that's on y'all. Like, cause more for it sounds messed up. Like more for me, it sounds a little messed up, but it's not because everybody has access. We, everyone has. If you have a cell phone, if you have a laptop, you have access to Google. Now, what you choose to do with your twenty, your twenty four hours and your resources is your business. Yeah. But nobody, be, nobody can be in charge of you. And the crazy thing is like. Okay, so like you be like dropping all kind of knowledge. You be like, this is how you do this. You know what someone will do? Uh, you think he better than somebody because he don't know. Like, you know what? Just just go. Just go. <laughs> like, all the time, like, oh, you think you know it all. And it's like, I, okay, fine. I can't even help you guys. Like, <laughs> and, and the thing about it, when I do drop, do only drop one account. I have a couple more stock accounts. So it's just like, y'all can't, yeah. you know, see that one but i just want to i just want to show people that it can be done yeah like, yo we know a bottle of henny go for like 36 range up to 42 dollars right yeah yo you could buy you could buy a couple stocks cheaper than that and yeah. but it's not glamorous i think to certain to certain to a certain portion of us, it is ideal. Like to people like you and I, people yeah. who are probably come to this podcast, they're like, oh yeah, we definitely on that. Cause that's like our mind frame. To certain people, that's not their mind frame. It's not flashy enough. Like what? That's gonna stop. Ew, uh, like I, no, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take this money and flip it on like someone. I had this conversation with someone and they were like, um, they were talking about like a, a, a stimulus package in the future and they're like oh what if the government gave everybody ten thousand dollars and this person legitimately was like i would take my ten thousand dollars and go to california buy some weed and come back and sell it and i was like why (laughs) i was like what (laughs) what did you just say to me and i was like why would that be the flip 
And he was like, oh, it's the quickest one. I was like, you know what, I'm done. I'm not having this conversation about why you're going to take $10,000 to go buy weed, not buy a license to sell it, like to, for a dispensary. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's the game, but also, like, just like, Weird. like, really do our research within the Black community of, like, entrepreneurship and, like, selling yeah. and stuff of that nature. Us selling items is deep-rooted in us due to the fact of that's the first thing we did coming out of slavery. Like, yeah. what was the first thing that we did coming out of slavery? So it's just like, I love it for the community. Yeah. jobs. However, we need to escalate, you know? Yeah. You yeah, know? and I, I think that, I honestly do see that, though. I do see escalation for us. I do see more of us on that path of um, hitting those numbers. I do. I see that like studying it now more than ever, I see that for us, but there's also this need to reach back, like how we're trying to do this educational thing where you're reaching back because you don't want to leave, right? As much as we're, we're kind of like, oh, F these people, they don't want to, you still have like this, this because you're a leader, right? Yeah. Your leader you won't allow you to know there's an easier way out and just be like, oh, okay, well, I can take my way out and F y'all. The leader in you is going to be like, you know what? Let me take what I've learned and give it back to people who, it doesn't matter if they want it or not, if they want it, it's there, it's available. Yeah. I, that's why I like, um, it's taken me a few years to get to that point, to feel comfortable enough to come out and be like, okay, this is this is how I've done it. Like, this is like, like I think that was last week, I made the post about like the family trust Oh yeah, we're gonna talk. We we can end it with that. We can end the podcast with that because that's, that's something fine. that um I'm actually me and my mother, we're gonna have a debate on Christmas. Like I told her that. Okay. We're gonna have a debate about um I'm gonna do the I'm gonna talk about the dynasty trust and mm -hmm. then we're gonna talk about another trust and then as a family, as a collective, we just gonna be like, okay, which one is beneficial for us? All that yeah. so we can build it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we can end it with that, the whole trust and true wealth and all that stuff. So a lot of what has happened in the Black community is um, families are separated. And when families are separated, so are the finances. And I think what what is a, a tipping point in creating generational wealth is not only putting families back together, but putting family finances back together. If you will notice, and again, it goes back to that whole self-made concept where people want to be, oh, I'm the one who did this, instead of doing it jointly together as a team. If you look at a family, right, say there's a, a parent figure, it could be mom and dad or one of the other parents, and then you have maybe one, more, one, one or more sibling, right? Between at least three people, you're probably having like three mortgages or three apart rental, like rent payments, three car payments, like, so you start totaling all that money up, right? Say you got a family, say there's like a mom and a dad, three siblings, all grown, right? Mm -hmm. mom and dad live together. That's one house, maybe two car payments. Let's say that that's like totaling, coming out at like, I don't know, $1,500. And then you got the first child. Now they may or may not be married, but Adam and let's say they're not married. They got their rent payment, their car payment. Second child, their rent payment, their car payment. Third child, their rent payment, their car payment. And so instead of having a, a big enough living situation where I call it a family house, Say there's like a, 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 we don't know how to live together with one another. Oh. We don't. And obviously there's trauma. Trauma's a, a good part of it. But also we don't know how to be collective in finances. So again, whereas like traditionally black families at the age of 18, you're out. You're on your own. You're getting your own. We don't your agree with it anymore. And, and the of it because yeah, you're in the Marine Corps. But, 
if you think about it, like the average black family is spending well over $10,000 collectively on just mortgage, rent payment, and car payments mm. annually. Like, if you put all the money together, think about all the money you could save if you knew how to live with one another in a big enough, like, imagine you buy a big enough house to facilitate. It was possible. Yeah. You could build, like, a big enough house where the parents live in the house and the, and the children live in the house and the children's spouse live in the house and the grandchildren. Most other, most other cultures operate like that. There's at least three generations under the same roof. Not so much for us. We're very quick to separate from one another, not realizing we're separating our finances from, from one another. When we come together, we have our, our buying power is astronomical. When we like to, we like to talk about it as like a, in a culture sense, but it's also a familial sense too. We, we've already acknowledged that we're stronger in numbers financially, right? That we have like this big buying, our buying power is like, out of this, it's in the trillions, right? Like dollar. Trillion, yeah. Right? Dollar bill, y'all. Like we're, we've already acknowledged that on a, on a culture level, but we won't let it ring true on a familial level as well. We won't allow people to say, you know what? Maybe you don't need to kick your child out at 18. Maybe it's okay for you to have a big enough house where y'all all live in it for however long. Or... Maybe it's not y'all not living in it all forever, but like think of the think of the financial impact you could have if you kept your family together and everybody's working, everybody's pulling in resources, and they're paying off whatever debts left and right. Y'all's family house is paid off, so now you have enough money freed up to where you can go buy two and three and four and five different houses because so much money has been saved. Because you haven't kicked somebody out at 18 and now they're paying rent for a place that that's not even theirs. Yeah, they can have a whole house at 24. Yeah. If you will allow them to stay a little bit longer, put your resources and money together, put your continue to put your money and resources together in the family. Maybe you do need to, maybe for whatever reason, you do need to live separately. I honestly believe that putting your money into a trust and, and, and it's like a... How do I, I don't know that, I guess that's the term for it, a trust. Like there's no other way to say it, but we're people, we need to get in the business of running our families like we run business, saying, you know, treating them like they're co-ops. You're going to spend a specific amount of money per month and give it to the family because then you're reducing family debt. Like you're reducing familial debt. What happens is, We've seen this. We've seen the wave of people who someone in the family passes away and the, the, what do they do? They come to social media and they say, hey, here's this cash app or here's this GoFundMe because this person doesn't have life insurance. There is no excuse for anybody to not have life insurance in 2020 or 2021. But <laughs> so professional. <laughs> yeah. But when, when you have a family that comes together collectively financially, Things like that don't happen because you have everyone coming together every month saying, okay, I don't care if it's, if it, even if it's just like $25, you get 10 family members at $25 a piece every single month. You've saved up enough money at a minimum to make sure everybody has life insurance, to make sure ain't nobody got to come on the internet talking about GoFundMe because at, for $25, what you could buy for $25? People spend $25 like it's nothing. You yeah. go. Uh, you can get something to eat for twenty five dollars off a of DoorDash. Exactly. Not, <laughs> but to get people in the mind frame that you could take that twenty five dollars that you're about to spend on GoFundMe and every single month make it reoccurring and get get your family back together. Like it's like a joint. It's like a team effort. Not only is it good for the finances, it's good for like healing trauma. Because the only way you can do this is if you. You have to play on people's strength. You have to acknowledge people for who they are and allow them to be a part of the process. And that heals trauma. Like that heals, that heal, that brings trust back into the family. Yeah, you can't heal what you what you don't reveal, though. Shout out to Jay Z. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what's the at minimum, like from your knowledge, briefly? Because because I, I have an idea for us later. Mm -hmm. But um, briefly, what is like the minimum amount that like each family member can put into a trust? 
he, yeah. <laughs> Can I do like five dollars for four family members a month type of? So the way I would do it, like, so the way mine, ours is set up right now, right? We have fifty dollars a piece, so it's fifty dollars per person. So right now it's me, my three children. So in the family monthly, I'm giving $200 because it's me and my three children. And then like my dad, $50, my mom, $50, my brother, $50. So like I, I would set it at 50 because that's what's comfortable for us. But again, that's, you have to sit down and have a conversation with the family to know yeah. what is a good amount to set at. But with that, is it a minimum that they can put? Because, you know, once this come out to the world, we, we, we're we dealing with, we don't know who may come across this and they'll be like, yo, I could do it, but 50 may be too much. Yeah, I don't think there's a minimum. I okay. think the, the amount is set upon whatever the family feels is feasible. For okay. some families, it's not feasible to put $50. But I guarantee you, if, if you have, if if you could find 10 people, 20 people, I tell you what, the lesser the amount, the more people you're going to have to have. That much I do know. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's good. That's good to know then. Okay. Yeah. There is like there is a there is a, a a method to it. But the less people you, the less money you're putting into it, the more people you're going to have to have. That what? makes sense like on a financial standpoint. Because, and depending on what you do with it as well. For me, what I would like to see families doing with the money is paying off life insurance. And if, that, if, if nothing else happens with this trust, you're ensuring that everybody has life insurance. I feel like that is something that just like is a standard thing. It's, 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 it's a collective thing. It, it, it works. Um, some families do it to where um, they do a lottery. Like they'll save up, like they might, end up with like $10,000 at the end of the year, maybe they don't use their trust for life insurance. They, they'll they save up like $10,000 or more than $10,000. Uh, my ex-husband's family, they do something similar to this and like, uh, but they raise way more. Like they be raising like $30,000 a year. Then people, they Jamaican, they work, honey. Uh, yeah. They'll raise like 30, $40,000 a year. And then at the end of the year, they'll go, they'll put their names in the hat and somebody's name will get drawn, they'll get $10,000, and it happens every year. And that's just like... And that's just like, based off, that's just like, but the money was saved up just in case, like if something happens to somebody, like somebody gets into a car accident or something, you know, something crazy happens to somebody, there's an emergency fund there that prevents people from either going to the bank and having to get a loan, or most of the time, most people can't even get loans from the bank. And that's why they have to end up going on GoFundMe. So to re remove all of that, you have the family coming together to show teamwork and ethics, to look out for each other, and to create, a, a, I guess, a, a, like a, a mini family bank. Yeah, I was about to say, remind me of that, got that little um, hexagon scam thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm <that's> <laughs> It don't remind no. me like the, the the premise of it is just like yo, if I get you to get in and get you to get in it, then you know whoever in the middle you know winds up getting the bread off of it. But yeah, okay. No, this is actually legally filed. <laughs> yeah. the Secretary of State, you know, what I'm saying you're a pyramid scheme. I guarantee you won't be able to show up to Thanksgiving if you out here pyramid scheme in the family, child. <laughs> Damn, that's dope. Yeah, so, and it works. It's effective. Like, again, I've seen it done so many different ways, but that's, again, one of those things where we don't have the knowledge, but most most families that are wealthy, that have had wealth in their family for generations, they have something like this set up. Mm -hmm. Where people in the family, they make payments to the family. What, what, what type of trust do you have for y'all for your family? I don't know. You have to ask my dad. Okay. Oh, he on it. Oh, big dog on it. <laughs> my dad uh, has been a huge, like, playmaker in who I am, who I turn out to be. My dad, just growing up, he always was, like, business business minded. My dad's retired from the Navy. And um, he just, yeah, like, we're military all through and through. 
So yeah, but he's just always been like very like business oriented about his business, like financially savvy. My dad's like a Taurus. I don't know. Like I play on uh on astrology. And I know are you a Virgo? Yeah. So earth signs are very financial, like they're the financial savvy people of the, of the, (laughs) but yeah. So he's always been like, take care of the family, make sure the family's safe, make sure the family has like whatever they need. And so, um, he like my dad's side of the family comes like from wealth. My mom's not, they don't, but my dad's side of the family. So uh, my great grandfather owned one of the first brick companies in the state of Georgia and so like you if you go to Georgia you'll notice like all the houses are like red bricked and so he owned like one of the the clay companies that used to make the bricks so like I have like a picture of my grandfather and like his business suit like my great-grandfather and his business suit and like his my grandfather owned like um um a seafood not a seafood restaurant, but like the 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 people who go catch the seafood. Gotcha. So like, yeah. yeah. He owned that. And then from there, like my dad went off to the military and like but my uncle went off to the military as well. But he got out early and started a seafood company, a seafood restaurant based off my grandpa's business. Oh. So that is still in business, like to this day. They love them. Um, no, not the, not my grandfather's, but my uncle's seafood restaurant is still in business, right? Oh. So my dad, um, my dad, his childhood dream was like to drive trucks. Like that was his childhood dream. He always wanted to drive like big trucks. And so when he got out of the military, that's what he did. Like that's how I learned how to follow my passion because I, 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 I was like that. I was like, why do you drive trucks? I thought it was so weird. I was like, why do you drive trucks? And he was like, I've always wanted to do it since I was a little kid. And I'll never forget him saying that to me. And then, like, when I left the military, I was like, dang, what do I want to do? And I was like, I'm going to do whatever I want to do since I was a little kid. Like, I learned from my dad. But, yeah, so, like, my dad has, like, this whole family idea. Like, it's been, again, passed down through generations, through generations. Like, this is how you take care of the family. This is how you keep the family together. This is how you, like, do the financial piece of the family. And so, yeah, so he takes, he's, taking care of all that. And I'm slowly like learning the road, like dad, teach me, you know, give me, the, give me the, some stuff he won't tell me yet. Like he's like some stuff he's like, you're going to learn after I pass away. Like, I guess like he has like this book or something. I'm guessing that's what it is. Like he has like these notes and stuff for me and my brother, my sister after he passes, but like some stuff he won't tell me, but like stuff like, yeah, like there is like, yeah. So nepotism yeah. isn't like, Y'all, y'all like it. Like it's yeah, stolen within the family. That's good. Yeah. yeah, I'm very big, very big. Ah, man, I, man, I'm very big on family. It's like a comfort thing, especially like during times like these. It is so, um, uh, it's a blessing to to have family, to be black and have family, to not feel alone. Mm. And I like. Yeah, it's like, even though I'm like one of those children, like, I used to say I would never go back home, but I don't know how sure I am. <laughs> I don't know how sure I am moving back to Georgia. It's, it's on my radar, moving back to Georgia. But really? um, yeah, it is. I miss home. I miss, I feel like I came to Minnesota and I needed to be here isolated by myself to do what I need to do to to get to my purpose. And I don't feel like yeah. I would have been able to do that. Yeah, but I've had a really great run in Minnesota, but I do miss family. I miss like I miss being home. I miss like that that getting together with the family. Like my fam like we have family meetings every Saturday at eleven o'clock. And we'll call everybody's on Skype, like FaceTime. We'll we'll FaceTime each other. And it's literally like a little mini business meeting, but for the family, we check in. Is anything wrong? Does anybody need anything? Uh, okay, what's the, what are we doing this week? Like we have like whole, like a calendar with scheduled family meetings every Saturday at 11 o'clock. Yo, that's dope. I'm writing stuff down to pass it. Yeah. That's, my <laughs> that, that's crazy. Like, yo, I want everybody to listen or that's going to watch this. Like, yo, you can learn from anybody. Yeah, you can learn. It's, well, it's fun. A lot of people, um, I think, 
I'm most excited to share this information because I want to get past this whole stereotype that all Black families are like broken or that they're that, you know what I'm saying? Like we don't know what to do or we don't know what we're doing. I feel like there are more families that are together, that are like working together. And I'm not oblivious to like the media doing what it does to kind of discourage us to be like, oh, well, everybody's family is broken and every and it's like, no, that's not the case. There are a lot of wealthy black families out here who who are doing things and like it, and it can be a thing, not only and if you don't come from that, it can be a thing for you too. Like you could be the first person, you can get it popping. You don't have to like just because you didn't come from that doesn't mean that it's if you didn't come from that, you should be more inclined to be the one to create that for the future generations. Exactly. Because sometimes all it takes is one good investment. That's it. And your family living good, like on generations and oh, generations. Like. That's it. That's it. I think that's like, I really want to hone in on like the investment piece. I feel like there should be more conversations with us about investing because It's like the asset piece. It's just like, it's like, it's so powerful. People don't understand the powerful, the power of having assets. A lot of time when we talk about an asset, most people jump straight to real estate and they jump straight to their first home. That's the very first thing people are like, oh, as long as I buy my first home, I'm good. I'm going to, I'm good. And it's like, no. No, that ties your money up again. You don't even need to get that far. You could, like you said, very small, very small, very small, $72 investments can take you there yeah funds and but people don't we don't it's not common knowledge right just like buying large plots of land for cheap is not common knowledge it's strategically hidden from a lot of people i would say the the art of buying isn't the art of buying is common knowledge Mm-hmm. What to buy is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, that's it. Yeah. Because that's like, uh, and I always tell people this. And because I get a couple of DMs here and there about you know the stock market. And it's just mm-hmm. like, yo, I could tell you to buy an apple all day. But I'm not telling you what to buy it at, you know? Yeah. Because like we all know was it August 20th hit. Apple did the four to one stock split. After the four to one stock split, they wound up they wound up hitting like one twenty four. I was like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm waiting. People buying. I was like, yo, why did you buy? Like, especially my close homeboys, because I'm like, yo, I ain't your fiduciary, I ain't your financial advisor. But I'm like, yo, why did you buy it? And then it was like, yo, because it's gonna go up again. I'm like, it's not. Like, it's just right now. Not one twenty two today. Yeah. <laughs> It, it wound up riding down to like 116. I pulled the trigger on that one at 116. Then it dipped to one to 109. Damn. I wasn't expecting it. But now yeah. the moment you sit and it's floating at around like 122. Like yeah, that's at 122 today. I'm like, yo, you know, if you didn't average down to are you you really losing money at this point. So yeah, it's education at the end of the day. I wanna um because I do want to talk to you offline about like three ideas I got in my head. Okay. Yeah. So, do you have any more tips, advice for anybody? Oh we- man. Um, these emotional demolitionists go. <laughs> oh man, I have so many. What's like, for you is for you. What's my what? No, I said what's for you is for you. Yes, what's for you is for you. Don't be afraid to speak your things. Don't don't ever be afraid to say to say something out loud because that is the signal to the universe that you're dead serious about it, that you want it. And there's nothing else, there's there's nothing that you could say that could take that away from you. The only thing that could take what's for you is from from you is fear of you not of it not being for you. So always believe in yourself, always take those risks. When it's time for you to go, go. <laughs> when it's time for you to go, go. But also learn when it's time for you to stay. Learn staying power. Learn endurance. Because it will, discipline, having discipline, will, will get you there. Google is free. 
That's my big piece of advice. Google is free. It's always free, 24-7. Jump <laughs> right in. Learn what you need to learn. Do the things. Yeah. Hey, y'all heard it. She said Google's free. <laughs> You got to learn your endurance and like learn what's for you is for you because, you know, um, entrepreneurship isn't for the weak. It, it's, it's not. It's, it's really not for everybody. It's not. Really, yeah, it's not for everybody. If, entre- if everybody was supposed to be an entrepreneur, there'd be no workers. Exactly. And, you know, just, and just because, you know, you've been making cakes for like three Thanksgivings don't mean you're supposed to be in business. So make sure you follow... <laughs> Make sure you follow your true passion, what is, what's in life, and educate yourself at the end of the day. Like, yo, yes, you know, we're on, a lot of us will be first-time millionaires or just trying to create that wealth or whatnot, but stay yeah. on that path and, like, seek help. Yeah, See, that's don't it. Don't be afraid to, to ask questions, but yeah. when you get to that platform or get to that next level, don't be afraid to reach back either. Yeah. And that's what these podcasts is about, baby. Reach All about. <laughs> so we all each keep- one reach one. Whether each one teach one, each one reach one, whatever. Hey, I, I know the, the the boot camp version is like, uh, damn, what was it? It's like reach out. It's like AT and T when you was on those hikes. Yeah, reach out and touch. Yeah, reach out and touch somebody. <laughs> yeah. Reach out, reach back. Yeah. yeah. Never- Go back and, and pull other people up when you're when you are up. Never forget to go back and, and pull others up. Exactly. Cause we all know man is a gift the money won't. So we're gonna keep that same energy. We're gonna close this out. Um uh, shout out your website. Ooh, all right, here we go. So we have uh www.carbonsolutions. That's K-A-R-B-O-N solutions llc.com you can find me on instagram at jamitra that's j-a-m-e-t-r-a dot grant underscore bp it's for vice president uh, <laughs> yes uh, on instagram and i ain't gonna tell y'all my facebook because i be wilding <laughs> <laughs> but it's all it's all fun and games. But uh, uh, make sure y'all check us out. Unpredictable thoughts to dot com. Keep that same energy merchandise, and we just dropped uh, the Donny T. So it's a lot of symbolism in that T shirt. So um, shout out to the young lad in doing that. So um, I have nothing else. Thank you for being on this call with me, Jamika. Thank you for inviting me to one of the greatest podcasts. Spinning right now. This is really you. You're up there with my other two faves, the Reed and uh, Keith of Kentucky. So yeah, I appreciate that because we don't be talking about shit. But <laughs> y'all be cracking me up. Y'all be having me laughing now. All right, peace. Oh, hold on. No, how did I stop recording? I have no clue.